Hello everyone, it's good to be here. I'd like to talk, this, uh, we're doing a bit of, this is a bit of a retrospective. So Patrick's keynote yesterday was very future facing and I'm kind of looking back at the last 10 years. So it's quite a nice bookend, I don't know whether it was deliberate, but anyway, that's, that's what it feels like to me. So my name is Matthew Skelton, my focus is holistic innovation across the organization. I'm the originator of Adapt Together from Conflux and the co-author of the book, Teams Apologies. I run, uh, end up running two companies. That's not what you're supposed to do if you're an entrepreneur, but that's where I am. Uh, Complex and Teen Topologies together. This book, Teen Topologies, uh, came out just over five years ago, September 2019. And I think it's fair to say it's been really, really influential in thinking and shaping how organizations um, approach effectiveness, certainly inside IT, delivery of software and things, but actually increasingly outside of the IT space as well in other knowledge work areas. There's been over 170,000 copies sold, so thank you all of you for, for if you've bought a copy, uh, and thank you if you end up going to buy a copy after this. Here's the question I'd like to try and answer today. 10 years after the state of DevOps reports that the, the person from Puppet just mentioned, 10 years after the state of DevOps reports and something called DevOps topologies, like a precursor, what is holding back lower performing organizations from improving their IT delivery performance. If it looks a little bit like this, well, I'll, I'll look back at what we mean by DevOps topologies and the state of DevOps report. Let's have a little look at the cost of tangled software. How much are organizations spending just on people waiting on other people inside the organization? We'll look at some approaches that can help. Um, and particularly if we can use some ideas from team topologies. And also then we'll look at some successes with this kind of approach. Here's the summary of the talk. If you'd like to have a little sleep, if you're a bit tired, here's the summary of the talk in one slide. We need to achieve decoupling of teams and technology for fast flow. But we also need to make sure we're diffusing ideas and for learning and alignment. You will see some slides that look like this. Bright yellowy, limey yellow green. So if you see one like this, this is a key point that hopefully wakes you up. Put it in your brain, store it away for later. Okay, little, little story. I actually spoke at DevOps Days 2010 in Hamburg. That was a long time ago. And there was someone called John Woodis there as well. Is John back today? He's not, not around. I think he, he, he was not feeling well. Anyway, it was amazing. This is a long time ago. I ended up doing a lightning talk. The slides are terrible. They're really bad, but they're still online if you're interested. And I think some of the messages in that slide, uh, in that slide deck are, are sort of still relevant today. Like the talk is about winning people to DevOps. Uh, and we still need to do it because some organizations are 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years behind. Um, I, was, I was speaking to, yes, well, this morning speaking to uh, some people at a large law firm, global law firm. And yesterday I was speaking to the CTO, one of the CTOs at, um, at a big a global financial company. And we need to do this stuff. We need to be thinking about how we advocate for these, these ways of doing things, even though many of us here have been doing this stuff for, in my case, like thinking about it for what's that, nearly, nearly 15 years. We need to kind of rehearse the patterns and we need to understand why we're advocating for this kind of DevOpsy way of doing things. Back in 2013, I was in an organization and there were some kind of epic battles between the kind of development group and the operations group. And it was kind of frustrating to see. So I ended up putting together um, a series of patterns to try and help myself work through different options for development and operations working more effectively together. And I wrote a blog post, uh, which is still up there on my, on my uh, WordPress blog. Um, and then we pulled it together into something a bit more polished called DevOps Topologies. And it's still there. And these patterns were used by, oh, you can buy, you can buy a poster of it as well if, you're, if you want to put something up in the office. These patterns were ended up be being used by organizations like Netflix and Condé Nast, uh, consultancies like Accenture, and so on and so on around the world uh, to help them work through this whole DevOps thing that was emerging at the time. 
Um, and we ended up using these patterns and kind of extending them through some consulting work that we did with some large uh, organizations in, in um, different parts of the world. And we got in touch with Gene Kim, uh, author of Phoenix Project and DevOps Handbook and so on and so on and so on. He's like a, basically a force of nature. Um, I saw him speak in DevOps Days London like 2013. Um, and, and it's been great to, to, to kind of be part of his sort of ecosystem or the, the ecosystem that he sort of um, nurtured and so on. And so then he said, yeah, Matthew and Manuel, I'd like to publish a book based on all of these, these kind of patterns. And that's, where, that's why, how we ended up being published by, by IT Revolution. And the book has been used by all kind of organizations around the world in the last five years. Uh, technology organizations like Docker, uh, healthcare like Flow, banks like NatWest Group, um, financial like Stripe, government, government and healthcare like NHS Digital in the UK, telecoms like Telenet in Belgium, and Zalando Retail, and so on and so on. There's loads and loads of organizations that have been using the patterns and uh, publicly sharing details of, of how they're using them, which is brilliant, and it's amazing to see. This is what the original DevOps topologies patterns look like. Who's seen these? Just raise your hand if you've seen these already. Maybe only less than half. Interesting. Interesting. So, um, and actually I was messaging on LinkedIn this morning and there was someone who's quite, uh, quite uh, influential at AWS um, who'd never seen these before as well, which, is, which, is, which was interesting to see, so I recommended them to him. So I recommend it. Go to devopstopologies.com. Have a look. There's some, they're categorized into anti-types and patterns. So here's one anti-type. If you've got a development team in yellow and an operations team in blue, but then if you put a DevOps team in between, then the dev team and the ops team can't really talk to each other because there's a, there's a, there's a wall in between. That probably doesn't work so well. Um, some organizations have what they call DevOps is really like a rebranded system administration team, shown in red there. And there's still a gap between development and operations, so there's, we're still not working as effective as we could be, and so on. This is a nice, spicy, fairly new one. This, this came out a couple of years ago. Uh, what used to be called operations is now called SRE, and it's still not talking to development properly. And so on, right? So there's patterns like this, which you'll probably recognize, and you go, yeah, that's us. So it's, it's, it's useful to have a look at. Then we've got some good patterns, like here's one, what we ended up calling type one. What could development and operations collaborate on? What could they work together on? These days, we would represent it looking more like this. We've got some different diagram style that's very uh, flow-centric. So we've got flow value arrow at the bottom there. And we'd represent this kind of collaboration using uh, what we call a collaboration mode with that, that purple dotted line in the middle. Um, but the intent is the same. So we've the diagramming style has shifted because we want to emphasize a flow of value across the organization. And in this case, the Stream Alliance team has end-to-end -end responsibility for that flow of value. They build and run it. Just like in Rob's talk, he was talking about how the, the, the development teams in the airline now have end-to-end -end responsibility. So that's, that's what this is representing because it's kind of all the, the full sort of value stream from you know, version control to production or whatever it is, concept to cache. And there's, an, there's some other diagrams in, in, the, in the original DevOps topology stuff, like um, this one here where we've got, there isn't necessarily any collaboration all the time. There's quite a, a, a clear boundary between sort of development and operations. These days, we sort of represent that uh, like we've got a kind of platform underneath that's providing services out to, out to the stream aligned teams, as we call them now, uh, and so on. There is a way to use a DevOps team in, a, in, a, in the middle in a useful way if that DevOps team is bringing together the two other teams to help them work better and more effectively together. These days, we sort of call that an enabling team and think about a dynamic that goes with the enabling team like detecting opportunities for improvement, detecting need, a need for upskilling, detecting a need for maybe training or something, something detecting a, a gap in the platform, and then going around that cycle multiple times to improve the experience for the streamlined team. Anyway, these teams bodies diagrams, the new ones in the book, they're always just snapshots in time. They're never fixed designs. We should always expect to be, have a dynamic approach to the relationship, the interactions between teams in our organization. Don't just see it as like an organizational chart. 
So here's the first point, put it in your brain, address the dynamic interactions between teams and groups, not just the static structure. That's one of the key things I think that we need to, that is holding back some organizations. They're just thinking about structure, they're not thinking, thinking about interactions. And in any complex adaptive system, like an organization, we absolutely need to be speaking to the interactions between, between the different groups. Who's read the State of DevOps report? At least one of them. Oh, here's another takeaway action. Go and discover this, the Puppet State of DevOps. Well, it's, it's Puppet and Google now, because there was a, an interesting, there was a fork, just as we like to do in open source software. There was a fork of the, of the report back in like 2019 or something. Anyway, there's a whole load of really valuable State of DevOps reports. Go and, go and have a read. There's, they're, they're really, really valuable. Go back all the way to 2013, lots and lots of um, uh, sort of survey of thousands of IT professionals annually. Here's a, here's a few spicy statements from the, the 2019 uh, Google State of Dev report. The use of cloud is predictive of software delivery performance and availability. Doesn't guarantee it, but if you are using cloud, something about the nature of using cloud predicts higher, um, higher performance. High performance favor strategies that create community structures at both high and low levels in the organization. There's something about the social aspect of what these organizations are doing that, that helps. Um, how about this? Heavyweight change approval processes such as change approval boards negatively impact speed and stability. For some organizations, this is like <laughs> brain explode time because, well, we're doing ITIL, we need a, we need a cab. That's actually bad. When we're going quickly, like the intent behind change, behind change um, advisory board is kind of good, but it just doesn't work when we're going very, very rapidly. And there's, there's loads of other factors that, that, the, that the State of Devils report um, pulled together. Um, in, the 29, sorry, in the 2021 State of Devils report from Puppet, um, there, was a, there was a kind of deep dive onto how team topologies is, is helping to achieve high organizational performance. And in fact, highly evolved organizations tend to follow the team topologies model. That's not entirely surprising because what we pulled together in team topologies was looking at some high-performing organizations back in the, uh, back in the early, um, early 2010s. So it's a little bit self-referential is this, but, but it, it's interesting to see that, 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 that in terms of the survey, they identified that team topologies had helped to move things on in terms of thinking. Team topologies ideas are now a key part of the AWS well-architected guidance too. And you'll also find that inside the Azure cloud adoption framework, some of the ideas from there in there too. What's going on though really here, um, so there's, there was this, there's been a, a co-evolution of practice at a practitioner level. That's what's really happening here between the DevOps topologies to team topologies evolution and from the, the evolution of the state of DevOps reports as well. This is very, very much like, this is well, partly why I'm here today, like this is a practitioner-led co-evolution of practice, and that's really, really important. This is not just like, we're not just coming up with some ideas and then trying to monetize them like some massive great framework. This is very much connected to what's happening on the ground. Okay, let's have a little look at the cost of tangled software. By the way, I don't have the countdown, so can you just tell me when I need to finish? <laughs> tell me when I got like five, 10 minutes left, what have you. Question, so let's imagine that we've got lots of different teams in the organization, and we've got this team that needs to wait on this team, and they need to wait on two other teams, and they're also waiting on a bunch of other teams in order to get their software out. That's what I mean by tangled software. So if each engineer in the organization is blocked for one hour per working day, how much does this cost? So they're waiting on this other team, and they're waiting, and so on and so on. Lots of waiting going on before we can finish what we're doing. How much does it cost? Let's say the fully loaded cost of each engineer is 160,000. Let's say there's 260 paid days per year and a total of 400 engineers. If you do the maths, it's eight million a year. Eight million a year that this organization is spending on, they're paying people to wait on other people. Cool, eight million, minimum eight million. Because in practice, this organization, people in the organization are probably waiting more than one hour a day. And even if they decide not to wait, they say, oh, I'll just start this other thing. Whoa, you've just increased work in progress and you're making things even worse. So there's millions and millions and millions of pounds to unlock by, by rethinking how we do work. 
We need to be decoupling things. We need to separate things that do not need to be together. Because the, the go-to approach in lots of organizations, particularly project management, is to bring things together, to couple things together, even if they don't need to be together. So we need to get rid of that mindset and decouple things, actively, actively push to decouple things that do not need to be together. Some things do need to be together, train carriages, for example, let's keep them together. But let's, let's try and find ways to decouple things that can be decoupled. We're enabling shorter time to value. Multiple independent flows of change, each with its own cadence. So it feels a bit messy. It feels a bit anarchic. But that's how we get to fast flow. It's how we get to scale with this way of working. It looks a bit like this in my head, left to right. It's like if it's code, it's version control on the left and it's production on the right, or concept to cache, that kind of flow. So here's the second, the, the kind of big uh, thing to put in your brain again. Organizing for fast flow helps us to remove inter-team dependencies, improving financial efficiency and time to value. One of, the, one of the things that is stopping organizations becoming more high performing is that they've got all of this like tangled mess of delivery going on. They're not decoupling it. We can use some metrics to help us think this through. Uh, the book called Accelerate came out in 2018. I think this is the last time I asked for a hands raise. I think you'll be glad. Who's read the Accelerate book or at least part of it? Yay. Right, there's your third bit of homework. Go and buy the book. Go and read it. Um, came out, yeah, 2018 by the same publisher, so IT Revolution, same publisher as Team Topologies. Um, and in there, partly based on the state of DevOps reports, they found four key metrics that help to uh, guide kind of the low-level part of, of effective software delivery. So lead time, deployment frequency, mean time to restore, change, fail percentage. This is a talk in itself. Like, I'm not going to go into the, the meaning of this and the nuance around this. These are not the only metrics you need, and so on and so on. But two of these encourage fast flow, which is lead time and deployment frequency, and two encourage operability, mean time to restore and change fail percentage. So it's a nice balance. It's a nice, healthy balance between going quickly and going safely, which is brilliant. We can add another metric called flow efficiency, which is the percentage of lead time, which is actual work. Turns out in lots of organizations doing manufacturing or knowledge work, in particular software delivery included, the actual time spent doing real value add work is actually vanishingly small. Like in this case, it's 16%. The majority of the time that people are spending is just spent waiting, waiting on other people, waiting on other things, waiting for a decision to happen, and so on and so on. Um, it, it's actually quite hard to measure wait time often. So actually what you do can just do is count the number of times you're blocked. And there's now, interestingly, applications like software tools and things coming out, which actually enable people to do this really easily. So oh, I'm blocked on this thing. I've had to, I can't progress on what I'm doing. Blocked. Tap, a, tap something on the app or just pop something into Slack, and a Slack bot will detect it and go, oh, it looks like you're blocked. Which kind of blocking do you think? Do you feel like, OK, yeah, done. Move on. And then over time, we're counting these things and using this as a really interesting signal. But what we can do is use these metrics to assess and find better service and team boundaries for flow. This is where it gets really interesting. So we're not just trying to game the metrics, because that's not a very helpful thing to do. If we use these metrics in the context of thinking through where team responsibility boundaries sit, it can really, really help. So like if we adjusted the service and team boundary here, would it improve these four key metrics? Would it, if, would it reduce the block account? So we've got, we've got the purpose of thinking through the, 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 the improvement of these metrics is now actually we're changing responsibility boundaries to enable flow. So it's a really useful perspective. And there's tooling, like I mentioned, that's coming out in this space. There's a tool called Teamform, which uh, helps us to map the organization and apply different lenses like remote agility framework or SAFE, if you really want, or team topologies and so on onto your organization and see what options you've got. And there's another tool called TeamOS. Um, disclosure, I invested in this one because I really, really like it. Uh, but they're doing amazing things. Um, so it's I don't know what these tools are called. It's like organizational operating system. I have no idea. But it's that kind of thing. It's actually able to like help leaders 
to find options, data-driven or, or sentiment-driven options for reshaping how the organization works to get better flow. Kind of cool. And there's some additional techniques from the Teen Topologies community to help with this. We just heard about heuristics uh, in the last talk. So we've got some heuristics called independent service heuristics which help to find good boundaries for flow. And it's a very collaborative technique um, which brings together people from across the organization to think through options for where we might reshape the organization in terms of responsibility boundaries and things like this. You end up, the way that we use it, so the, 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 the heuristics themselves, the criteria are Creative Commons or open source, but the techniques that we use, we, we've, we've kind of done some additional things on top. You end up with a heat map, which is very easy for people to kind of reason about, and you can then try out kind of end-to-end -end responsibility boundaries. Um, for flow quite um, with a good degree of confidence. A technique called user needs mapping, which is really helpful. It's a little bit like, well, it's, it's a, it uses a technique called Wardley mapping, but we don't do the whole thing. And again, we try and find in useful potential boundaries for flow. Um, so it, this plays into the kind of strategic aspect. So you can speak to people who are more focused on kind of company strategy and things, and it helps them to see opportunities to improve flow. And then a, a, a technique using the team topologies team, um, team diagrams called team interaction modeling. And this also really helps because it's, it's quite intuitive and it helps people uh, think through how we can get better flow across the organization. These techniques are all open and you can go and use them. Key point, evolving at speed requires a set of core principles and practices with people trained up and engaged. We can't just like expect people to just like, get it. There's some, some of this stuff is like, requires like a bit of a shift or potentially a big shift in the ways that, that, we're, that we're asking people to think. Just like in Rob's talk, like we, we were working in this way. We might be sad to leave that way of working. How can we persuade people that we're actually working in this other way is gonna be actually more compelling? That's actually at the heart of teen topologies, to be honest, is a much more humane, engaging way of working. Okay, let's look at some success with fast flow, with, this, with all of this kind of approach. There's a really interesting case study from J.P. Morgan. They presented at, at uh, Fast Flow Conference 2023. How J.P. Morgan applied team topologies to improve flow in a market-leading enterprise platform. You can watch it on YouTube later. Don't, don't play it now. That would be embarrassing, right? But you can watch it later. Get the link from the slides. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the, uh, the hated like red string dependency thing. Um, they mapped out all of the dependencies during delivery, and it was very tangled, like a tangled spider's web. On the right-hand side, uh, the, then after, that, after mapping it all out, then they used Team Topology's principles to reshape the team and service boundaries. And you can see on the right-hand side, the result of that was a significant reduction in the number of dependencies. And it turns out that they actually reduce 60% of dependencies through better team design. So they're applying these techniques. It's not a noddy situation. It's a, you know, it's JP Morgan, they're doing investment and all kind of stuff like that. It's a, you know, it's fairly serious kind of uh, context for, for applying these things. So we don't know how much they saved, but if you remember the, the calculations from before, where it was 400 engineers blocked for one, one hour a day, it was costing at least 8 million a year. We don't know how much they save, but it's, it's, it's significant, basically. They unlocked extra money to be able to do more useful things, shorter time to value, better focus on customer needs, and so on and so on. There was an interesting experience I had at the uh, UK government back in 2018. Um, th there was some work they did to reduce cloud costs, and there's actually a, um, a, a case study published on the UK government website how the Home Office's Immigration Technology Department reduces cloud costs by 40%. And it's really cool. I worked literally, literally sitting next to the people who were doing this work day in, day, in, day out. They did this kind of energy efficiency thing, for, but for cloud costs. I think they've just won an award. I think the people involved have just won an award for this, for this work. It's really cool. So like, they were basically saying, hey, you're, 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 the way you're using the cloud right now is costing more than it could do. Here's some options. You can reduce your cloud cost by doing this, this, this. All great, like brilliant stuff. But what I observed, what was interesting to see, was that actually making the service owners accountable for the spend on their service actually gave them an incentive to think about the context of their 
service boundaries. So they were like, hmm, I don't want that to be that cloud cost to be included in my service report. That feels like it's separate. So they, they initiated a conversation about what, what really should be in versus out, and that's architecture. What's in, what's out. So using these cost metrics is like a financial knife, a scalpel to split the services apart for fast flow. It was really interesting to see. I think you could probably take it too far, but it was an interesting technique to, uh, to see in, in action. It's a little bit like FinOps, a little bit like kind of something a bit like FinOps working there. And there's a uh, more recent example from a company called ABC Glowfox. They do gym management software. They're based in Ireland. And we've just published uh, a really amazing report from them. We worked with them to kind of uh, understand how they'd used fast flow techniques, team policy techniques, and, and good DevOps practices, and so on and so on, to help make their organization work really, in a really, really effective way. So if you go to, um, if you go to the website complexhq.com slash glowfox, you'll be able to download that report and find out all the details. But it's, it's really, really worth, um, it's worth reading. Uh, we wanted to package it up in a way which is like, look, here's an example of effectively how to do it. It's not exactly a playbook. But it's like it, it gives some clues, some heuristics, I guess, about how to make this stuff happen. Our instinct should be to decouple, not coordinate. And there's a bunch of principles from team topologies that suggest like certain kind of ways of, of doing things. Like we've got lots of different independent flows across different parts of the organization. Uh, we need to think about Conway's law. That's a key concept from Team Topology's book, which is the mirroring that we get between the communication pathways in the organization and the likely architecture that results. We need clear ongoing ownership or stewardship of services and systems on an ongoing basis. We've got end, we need to have end-to-end -end responsibility for a service. You build it, you run it, just like Rob said in his talk with the airline platform. The purpose for me of a platform is to improve flow and reduce extraneous cognitive load. And when you see a platform as, uh, when you see the purpose of a platform as doing this, it opens up all kinds of new ways of exploring how we can use technology or how we can use a wiki or how we can use different approaches instead of, instead of focusing on a platform being technology. It, this, this is one of the most useful, I think, takeaways from Team Topologies really, is, is reframing what we mean by a platform. <clears throat> Teams are small, up to about nine people, and they change slowly, and they've got some, like, a good degree of autonomy. Um, in, most, in most big organizations, having small teams of like up to eight or nine people is like very, very small, because they're used to groups of 50 or, or 70 people altogether. And, and we, we want small teams because then we get higher trust, and with higher trust, we can make decisions more quickly. And crucially, teams are empowered to sense and adjust these boundaries using techniques like team interaction modeling and independent service heuristics and those uh, accelerate metrics and so on and so on. So we can improve flow on a frequent basis. Um, so you end up with an ecosystem of loosely coupled, independently viable services with clear boundaries and ownership, and these are aligned to the flow of value. <clears throat> But this is not the case, this is not the design principle that loads of organizations have run with. Some organizations have Amazon Web Services, Netflix, and so on and so on. They've had this the approach for nearly 20 years. But other organizations have not. And are just starting to kind of move towards this sort of mental model of how their organization can, can exist and thrive. Um, some nice success stories, so Flow Health. Um, Use team topologies to simplify upfront planning and it streamlined execution with just enough collaboration. That's from uh, Maxim Coutin. Um, but it's complicated. So, a tiny little advert. If you're looking for help with this stuff, get in touch with my team at Team Topologies and we can help you because we've got some amazing people in this space. We help product technology and engineering leaders design high impact team of teams organizations. So we need multiple loosely coupled flows of value with significant automation and helper tooling aware of team cognitive load. That's, a get, that's another thing that Team Apologies, the book brought in, really or helped to magnify at least the importance of thinking about the cognitive load on the team or the mental load on the team. 
All right, we've got these multiple independent flows fractally across the organization. If we've got these clear boundaries for flow, and we've got limited interactions, how do we create alignment? How do we learn from each other at pace? There's a danger in here that we've got, let's say there's 100 teams. There's a danger we've got 73 teams all looking to work out how to integrate, integrate ChatGPT or Claude or something into their services. But they're all doing it independently. They're not like sharing their results with each other. Because we kind of deliberately want some good boundaries for flow. So there's less opportunity for sort of working together and collaborating. And now we've got into a situation where there's actually an incredible amount of waste, potentially, if you take it too far. So how can we actually create alignment and learn from each other if we've got these strong boundaries for flow? We need something that's kind of going sort of across the organization somehow, like that. Like diffusing, actively diffusing knowledge across team boundaries. So imagine some like, imagine some incense or room sticks like these, but we've got a fan at the side of the room. We're blowing that smell across the room like this, right? So everyone kind of gets the, gets the, gets the scent. Did you like my dance? Was it good? Yeah, OK. I promised I promise Sophie that I'd do some dancing, but that, that was the one. <laughs> do you remember this from the State of Devils Report 2019? High performers favor strategies that create community structures at both low and high levels in the organization. Community structures are there so we can learn and share and build trust. Things like internal conferences, public blogs, guilds, lunch and learn sessions, communities of practice, and these kind of things. Often in many organizations, these things are sort of done like side of desk. It's a few uh, people who are kind of committed, and the organization just kind of allows them to get on with it. OK, great. If that's working, that's great. But in some organizations, that stuff just is not existing at all. It just doesn't exist and, and is not being funded. I, I ran some internal conferences at a company in London when I was based here. And I, went, I got together with Victoria Morgan Smith, who also was involved in running conferences. She ran them at Financial Times. Uh, and we wrote a book, Internal Tech Conferences. This was published just before the Team Topology's book, early 2019. So we kind of were trying to make these techniques more accessible to other people. And the CEO of the organization where I worked at the time said, this initiative around internal conferences has been the single most effective thing to align business and technology that I have seen in this organization. Now, at the time, I kind of, I, I put, stored it away in my brain and then forgot about it. But coming back to it more recently, what this means is internal conferences and similar things are worth millions and millions and millions to every organization. Because if the CEO cares, the CEO cares about strategy and alignment. And a few other details, but significantly strategy and alignment. If people in the organization are not aligned on what they're doing, if they're pulling in different directions, that is costing the organization millions and millions per year. So these kind of activities are hugely valuable. It's complicated again. <laughs> this, is the, this is the tricky bit. We did some work with um, TELUS, telecoms uh, company in Canada, uh, to help them with this, with this challenge. So Steve Tanak said the way that the complex crew use their active knowledge diffusion approach to seek out and champion good practices was a real revelation to us at TELUS and helped to shift thinking around how we innovate and share successes. That lots, having lots and lots of little teams frantically innovating on stuff is not innovation. That's just noodling around. What you want is a more coherent approach to innovation where we're then sharing that awareness and using that to activate what we're doing uh, in, a, in a more coherent way. So we've pulled all this stuff together into like a package called Adapt Together. Uh, to help create alignment and trust and engagement across your organization whilst delivering at pace with fast flow. We're not trying to slow things down. We're, we're expecting things to go quickly, but we've got um, uh, uh, a kind of way of doing it which has worked. So here's the fifth thing I think that organizations need. They need active knowledge diffusion across flow boundaries to create trust, alignment, and learning. But won't generative AI make all this irrelevant? I hear you shout, right? No. But that's, a, that's another talk. The short version is we might not be programming in the same languages, but we'll still be needing to shape the intent of the organization around what happens. Even if Gen AI is the thing which generates all the code, 
we need to be shaping what Gen AI is actually is creating in the first place. And we, so we still need this intent. We still need learning. We still need the same kind of patterns in place. So 10 years after the state of DevOps report and DevOps topologies, what is holding back lower performing organizations from improving their IT delivery performance? Organizing for flow feels really alien, I think. This is what I've realized. There's some limited mindset shifts, particularly at the executive level. We're doing now work at the, typically speaking, we now work at the kind of C, C-suite level, helping to shift um, mindsets there. But often the, the C-suite concerns are ignored. We're not listening to what execs actually need. Some people are looking for like a silver bullet and that we're just adopting into policies and that will solve all our problems. Uh -uh. There's lots of other stuff we need to look at too. They just expect a reorganization is gonna fix it. But it's the dynamics that we need to be playing to and thinking about. We've got a lot of tight coupling in time. Lots of things are tangled together. We need to detangle that. And in many organizations, there's no knowledge diffusion, no active diffusion of knowledge across the organization. That's really slowing things down. You've seen some success factors in yellow. I'll skip over them now. They're in the slides, which, which are already online. And I'll leave you with a single slide. Oh, yeah, go and download the Glowfox uh, success story. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It's super inspiring. Complexxq.com slash Glowfox. Here's a single slide summary. We need decoupling of teams and technology for fast flow and diffusing of ideas for learning and alignment. Thank you all. Awesome. Thank you so much.